Good evening. My name is Adaranka Badamosi Wilson, and I'm the moderator for tonight's Vaccine Awareness. Join the conversation. Tonight's panelists are uh, Dr. Ayo Ola Oyinloye, the Chief Medical Officer for the Government of Bermuda, Dr. Michael Ashton, uh, the Bermuda Hospitals Board Chief of Medicine, and Bermuda Government Science Advisor, Dr. Karika Walden. Good evening and welcome to the panelists. Uh, tonight's talk will be about Bermuda's vaccination program and for you as viewers to learn about how the COVID vaccine works. If you are watching on government's Facebook page, I encourage you to post your questions below and I will pose those questions to the panelists for them to answer. We're also joined this evening by Ms. Loretta Cartwright, who's the sign language interpreter for the deaf and hard of ear hearing. Good evening, everybody. How is how are you all doing? Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. So let's get started. Um, Dr. Walden, I'll start with you. You got the vaccination uh, this week. How was it? And uh, tell us a little bit about your experience. So it, it was similar to any other vaccine. Um, the last time I had actually gotten a needle in my arm, I was probably about five or six. So it definitely took me down memory lane. Um, but other than being on live TV, um, it wasn't too bad actually. Um, had, the, had the shot in my arm. Um, there is a bit of a waiting time after they monitor you was fine, you know, was looking around. I think obviously there's so much hype around the vaccine that everyone on the first day was just, you know, very much heightened and aware. But I think it went really smoothly, very smooth process. And ever since I've been fine, I had a, a bit of flu-like symptoms, I think on the second day, um, but just had a, you know, nice nap and, and rested and I've been fine ever since. All right, great. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Ayo, uh, let's talk about the registration process for the vaccine. How can somebody who is eligible and fits into the prioritization categories, how can they register to um, be vaccinated? Well, thanks, Dr. Okay. Um, the, the Our preferred route for registration is through uh, the gov.bm website. So if you go to gov.bm, you see a big red banner that talks uh, and highlights the, the most important issues of the day. And there is a link that takes you um, into the vaccine registration form. So once you've done that, um, uh, it asks you for a couple of questions and then takes your details and submits it into uh, the ministry central uh, database. Uh, where that would be looked at, uh, prioritized, and an appointment offered uh, to each person at the appropriate time. So that's the process that um, uh, it takes to register for this. Excellent. Thank you. And um, Dr. Ashton, I understand that vaccinations went, uh, were taking place at the hospital. How, how did those go? Well, I must say I was really impressed. Uh, it was very well implemented. Uh, and I'm very proud of our team. Uh, we um, have thus far given about one in three, uh, just ballpark, um, uh, healthcare workers the first dose and two in three of our long-term care residents. Uh, and uh, we're actively vaccinating. All those that are eligible and want the vaccine, uh, we'll certainly be making it available for them. I'm aware of uh, one mild to moderate reaction, which was a rash, and that was the only event that we had. Um, having received the vaccine myself, I can say uh, in some ways it's a little anticlimactic in terms of, uh, you know, just, well, we got to get back to work. <laughs> <laughs> th thank you very much. So Dr. Walden, I think this is a good opportunity to ask you, tell us exactly how does the vaccine work? Yes, happy to do so. So normally vaccines, uh, and you know, vaccines have been around since 1796. It's been, been a while. Um, the normal way the vaccines actually operate is that they give you a dead or a weakened version of the actual virus. And what that is doing is in a way giving your body an unfair fight that it can win, uh, but it's allowing you to see the virus and be able to 
go through the whole process that your immune system would normally go through, uh, which means creating antibodies. And so when you do now have the actual real infection, hopefully you don't, but if you do, your body can quickly react, call on the troops, destroy the virus, and you don't have to get sick. So that's normally how they work. The issue with that is that some people, not many, but it does happen that some people, when they get vaccinated, actually get the disease. So the weakened version may be a bit too strong for their immune system. And so we wanted to try to avoid that. So for many decades now, it's been looked at how do we get around this? And so one of the options has been to give a small portion of the virus, not the whole thing, just a small part that wouldn't necessarily get you sick, but would allow your body to go through that whole process and give you those fighting antibodies that you that you need. Um, and so that has been done. There, there, are, there are vaccines like that for other diseases, but taking it a step further, because to, to make the small piece of virus it still takes a lot of effort and energy and a lot of time in the lab to create that. And so the idea came, okay, how do we utilize the body's already existing mechanism to create stuff? That happens all the time. Everything that you see in yourself and me has been created by our body from the DNA, which is like the blueprint to what's the protein, which you all see. How can we use that to our advantage and, and allow the body to actually create this piece of the virus and then allow the whole process to happen. And that's what we're experiencing now with this mRNA vaccine. They have been studied since the year I was born, 1990, I know, just gave my age. Um, and, and it's been around for uh, like my whole science career. I have been to conferences all over the world and actually heard about RNA vaccines for a very long time. It was always almost like a, wow, one day we will get there. And to be here now is, is pretty exciting. And so cut to the chase, this vaccine is giving you the spike protein, which is on the outside. I think everyone's seen a picture of a coronavirus a million times. It's the thing on the outside that's like, you know, like pointing out. Uh, it will create that part of the virus based on the instructions, the mRNA that is being given to you in the vaccine. And what's awesome is that not only does the piece that your body is making get destroyed, that's the whole point, so your body can learn how to fight it, but the instructions, the actual MRA themselves, also gets destroyed. And so all you're left with is the ability to now fight off this infection if it ever comes, which is what we want. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that comprehensive overview. Um, so I'm just going to go to some questions that we're receiving um, here on Facebook. And uh, so Dr. Ayo, one question. Uh, when can someone like myself, 78, with problems such as asthma, uh, I guess that's COPD and AFib, expect to get the vaccine? Okay, so um, the first priority group, and we are almost true with that, um, is uh, people who are 80 and above or residents of long-term care settings alongside um, healthcare workers. Uh, we're almost uh, certainly almost true with uh, the healthcare worker. So the next step is uh, basically people with long-term conditions and people who are over 65. And um, the case you've just described, the person you've just described now would certainly fit into the next step. So that should happen next uh, uh, week or so. Okay, excellent, thank you. Um, one person, Ms. Manis, says uh, she registered over the phone last week, but has not received any confirmation as, as yet. Uh, she's called to follow up, uh, but not been, not the, doesn't have confirmation that she's actually on the list. Uh, does she need to register on the website? Uh, she's a diabetic and a teacher. Okay, so she uh, would... Uh... If uh, details has been collected by telephone, you don't need to re-register. Um, there is a prioritization uh, schedule that we're following and um, without knowing the full details of the person who's asking, um, I don't know where they fit within that prioritization. So that's probably why they've not been called. There isn't a need um, to register twice because if you do register twice, you're just duplicating the entry and that doesn't, bring you any closer to the front of the queue. So um, 
just have a bit of patience. We will get round to everybody who wants to take this vaccination very soon. And so um, just, just to piggyback on that question, is the vaccine mandatory? Uh, no, we are, the, the government does not plan to make this vaccine mandatory. We believe that we'll be able to get uh, the level of protection that we need as a country uh, through the voluntary uh, 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 acceptance of this vaccination by Bermudians. Thank you. Um, another question is, uh, so nothing changes. We're still going to have to wear a mask, physically distance. Uh, is that correct? Uh, so, unfortunately, that, that for in the short term, that is correct. Um, there is, this vaccine uh, has been shown to reduce coronavirus disease. And there is a lot of uh, research going into uh, an analysis of the data going into uh, what impact the vaccine has on transmission. Uh, but until that is clear, or until we feel that we have enough people on Ireland vaccinated to provide us with that protection, unfortunately, the uh, public health and social measures will still need to continue. Um, for, just because we don't want to be the source of uh, the germs to other people who may then end up developing serious complications. Adaranka, if yes. I may, I, I would just say that um, a lot changes, though, after you get the vaccine in the sense that there's a huge sense of relief in terms of knowing that you're now much less likely to get disease or severe disease. Uh, so uh, although there are other things that will happen, I think, in the future, um, a lot of us in, in the hospital um, uh, feel a sense of relief uh, having that additional level of protection. Thank you, thank you very much. So we've heard in the news lately that the US and UK are requiring, and other places actually, are requiring um, a pre-arrival test, uh, similar to what Bermuda's asking for you to be, uh, to have a negative test on arrival. Um, is Bermuda geared up for people leaving Bermuda to receive a test so that they'll be admitted to these countries who are now asking for it? Dr. Ayo, do you wanna start? Yeah, absolutely. So the first thing I'll say is good on them. Uh, they're finally catching up to what Bermuda has been doing for several months. Um, and um, while we know it's not a silver bullet, but it provides us with that extra level of protection. Um, so the typical visitor to Bermuda um, will uh, come in here, uh, well, we'll have to have a pre-flight a test and, and then have a, a test on, on arrival on day four and day eight and day 14. And if they're leaving at any point in time during that period, uh, the, the tests that they've had uh, could be used as um, uh, the entry test into the US and the UK and, and other jurisdictions as required. Um, I, I know that the MDL laboratory is working on tweaking the results to make that acceptable to all these jurisdictions uh, and, and make that work well. In addition to that, the ministry is also working on a plan um, to have a bespoke system uh, targeted at travelers so that um, we can have that uh, working alongside um, the tests that we have that is designed to protect this island primarily. So that, that works hand in hand. And that will be in place in a few weeks. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ayo. Dr. Walden, can you talk about it from um, the perspective of your lab? How are you guys gearing up? Yeah, so um, as the CMO um, has already said, we have already been kind of doing this. Um, yes, we, you know, six months ago implemented a pretest into Bermuda, but actually all of our visitors fly back, you know, through the UK, the US and Canada already and have already been using their day four, day eight or day 14 or arrival test to go and, and travel on. So I think the Ministry of Health did analysis and so actually it was about 60% of those visitors that were already leaving on a day that would allow them to use that test. Um, we use the RT-PCR test for everyone who gets tested at Parat testing facility. And so they would classify as a valid pretest. Um, the other interesting thing that we've, we've seen for months since the airports have opened is that residents have been going to the community already 
to get tested, to travel. They then email us or they email the hotline asking for their official results. So this has already kind of been happening, I guess, unofficially, um, but we're just kind of going to formalize the process. Um, and as the CMO again alluded to, that we will be slightly changing the official report, what it looks like, so that it fits what the requirements are of the US, the UK, and Canada, so that no one leaving Bermuda has that you know, added anxiety that, oh, I need, I need this piece of information and none of that. We, we're making sure that we're sorting that out for you. And I think the big question that we've gotten a lot is why when we get a negative email, we don't automatically get the PDF. And so that is something that's also being worked on for those that are traveling. Um, you should potentially in a few weeks time uh, uh, through the work that the ministry is doing, be able to already have your PDF and not have to email us and go to those extra hoops. So yeah, we're seeing, I think the number of projection was about a 20 to 25% increase as what we're expecting in some testing um, in our side and we're, we're ready for that. Um, and also to give you guys the reports, we're also gearing up for that to make it a bit easier. Excellent, thank you. Now I'm gonna throw out a question uh, for the three of you to consider and answer amongst yourselves. So. Uh, early on this week, we saw, on Monday actually, we saw the Premier, the Minister of Health, the opposition leader, and Dr. Weldon get the vaccine. And all the media was there. It was covered extensively. However, uh, word came back that uh, the needles weren't right, or the, there were issues with the needles that were used. And um, since which, we've learned a lot about retractable needles. Let's talk retractable needles. What are they? How do they work? Who uses them? Are they real needles? <laughs> Please tell us. If, if I can start um, being in the, the clan of us who got tested on live TV, um, I can definitely attest to the fact that I had something sharp enter this arm and it was very painful for a few days. Um, there was a needle that went into my arm, but I will say as well that I think it's healthy that as a country we are questioning and that's how we learn. That's like a scientist instinct is just to question everything. So I'm happy that we're doing that. And what the result has been is that the country is probably the most well-versed on retractable needles around the world. So I'm happy for that. Um, I'm gonna hand over to uh, my medical colleagues there because they could obviously have a bit more experience with this. Uh, Dr. Okay. Aya, do you want to take it first? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, um, I've been a doctor for 20 years, and that's a, a, a 21 years actually. Um, uh, and as a junior doctor, I can remember on several occasions where I actually pricked myself inadvertently with needles. And that's, uh, that's something that uh, a, a lot of people who've trained in medicine would be familiar with. Uh, we're grateful for a new technology that allows us to have um, added safety measures uh, to uh, giving uh, injections. So what happens with the retractable needle is that once the injection has been given, you can actually withdraw the needle into the body of the syringe and that no longer is a risk to the person giving the injection. So the chances of you transmitting blood-borne germs is eliminated completely. And that is extremely important. Um, uh, to, it's an extremely important safety feature for any healthcare worker. So um, it's new, it's, well, it's not, not, not very new, but it's, um, it's gaining uh, traction um, across the world. And that was what was used um, on Monday for uh, the now infamous video that um, generated so much interest on in social media. It's, it's, it's a safety feature to protect healthcare workers. And Dr. Ashton, I invite you to join the conversation. Well, that, that's an in, intriguing conspiracy there. Um, uh, but I must uh, also agree with Dr. Ayo and Dr. Walden that, uh, you know, the, uh, wherever possible, we try to actually engineer safety into healthcare. Uh, and so at the hospital, uh, it's actually preferred that uh, we use either the retractable needle or uh, a needle that has a guard uh, that goes over the sharp tip. Um, I can recall a case as well where I had a needle exposure and, and it's, it's actually quite traumatizing because of the risk of bloodborne pathogens being transmitted. And I still to this day see 
uh, healthcare workers um, uh, who have had these exposures. So um, we actually would like to universally use retractable needles, um, uh, but we're not quite there yet, um, but striving for that. And so just so that we're clear, and as we're getting the vaccinations, some will have retractable needles and some will have the more traditional, is that correct? That's correct. It, at least at the hospital, it's based on availability. Um, and uh, so we have, uh, not, we actually also have just the standard traditional needles. Um, so it really depends on where you go. Okay. And and the both given the vaccine, the, it, it doesn't, it, there is no difference in the needle and the vaccine. I just want to be absolutely clear for everybody. Again, I can attest to um, some distinct tenderness in the arm uh, for three days afterwards, a little Tylenol, and uh, I was fine. I was back to work the next day. Um, and it's a good point, actually, that um, most everyone can expect at least um, some mild symptoms, nine out of 10 in the phase three trial for uh, the Pfizer vaccine uh, had some form of mild symptoms. And that's really just your immune system recognizing the spike protein antigen as Dr. Walden had described. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much for um, that education on retractable needles. Um, so let's go back to um, the Facebook questions. Um, what are the differences in vaccines available and how much do they differ in the effects on COVID-19? And that's from uh, Deborah Marie. Who'd like to take that? I, I can start. Um, so yes, uh, at the moment, the, the vaccines, uh, uh, the, the main vaccines have been uh, approved at, uh, um, in the UK and the US and Canada is uh, the Pfizer vaccine, the Moderna version, and the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. But the as, um, Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines are mRNA vaccines have been described by Dr. Wolden earlier on. Um, AstraZeneca's vaccine is a slightly different one because what it does, it, it uh, uses an adenovirus that, is, that infects chimps normally, so it's not a human virus. And it's now been genetically engineered, one, not to be able to reproduce in the body, and two, um, to express the uh, proteins that you would find on um, the uh, COVID SARS-CoV-2 virus. So it's, it, it has uh, the proteins that you have. So the body is then tricked to think that, well, it has been attacked by COVID and then the, uh, all the uh, defense mechanism in the body um, is brought to bear to, to protect that. And um, that the the figures that we get from the trials are, uh, I need to emphasize that those are laboratory um, study conditions. Uh, in reality, there's virtually no difference in um, the efficacy of both um, of, of these vaccines. They are all very efficacious. The side effect profiles are. Uh, non as very, very mild as Dr. Ashton has uh, explained, and uh, major side effects are, are very rare. So in terms of um, efficacy profile, very similar. In terms of side effect profiles, very similar. Excellent. Anybody want to add anything else to that thought? Any other commentary? I can jump on that. So. Um... It's interesting as well to talk about the Oxford vaccine because the actual vector, so what Dr. Seema just described, is an adenovirus, doesn't in, in infect or make humans sick. Um, prior to COVID, I, I have a paper actually from the time I was, because I worked at Oxford, feels like a billion years ago, mind you. Um, when I was there, I actually see, worked with the team that was actually doing the work on this vector for other you know, research prior to the pandemic and actually sequenced that vector myself. So I know firsthand it is exactly what they're saying. And I have a paper published you know, in a journal with that data. So um, it's, it's intriguing. Again, there's questions about what's in the vaccine. Um, there's no human cells in any of the vaccines. It's not even fathomable to do so. Um, they are safe. Um, as Asima has uh, indicated from the data, they work. And that's why they've all been approved. 
I'll, I'll just add that um, the, the best vaccine will be the one that's available uh, and that you can get uh, safely. Um, and so when it comes to right now, it's the Pfizer vaccine. Um, you can't get better data really in medicine than what we've got. Um, the phase three trial was superbly done. Uh, the data is impressive. 95% uh, effectiveness is very unexpected and welcomed. Um, so that's close to a miracle in my books. Uh, and the uh, side effect profile is excellent as well. So um, this is an excellent vaccine. Thank you. Thank you all for your answer. And so while we're talking very specifically about the vaccine, can you share your thoughts on the new strains that we're seeing of the coronavirus and how this vaccine will um, work with those new strains? Yeah, so this has um, become a bit of a hot topic every week for the last, uh, I want to say about a month or so. Uh, we first heard about the uh, the UK strain that was new and seemed to be more infectious. Um, and then we heard one from South Africa that also seemed to be, you know, a, a threat. And now we've heard of a few uh, that are emerging from Brazil. And all of these new strains, I think uh, the, the main question, rightly, as you asked, is how does this affect vaccination? It's already shut down um, flights, but how is this going to affect what I've just done to my body? L literally asking that question for myself. And so, what I will say is that all of the vaccines do actually have the code for the spike protein in it. All of them in some way, shape or form allow the body to make that. And so anything that starts to change the genetic makeup of that spike protein message will potentially be at risk. Um, I know for the, the newest Brazilian strain, there is uh, a particular mutation that is, is worrying, but at the moment, I believe the, the first strain had been studied, um, and I believe, CMA, you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, it was shown that the Pfizer vaccine was still, was still work. So that, that's good news for us. Uh, what I will say, though, is if I go back to my explanation of how vaccines are made, and especially the mRNA ones, and, and even the Oxford one, the way that they're made now compared to growing up a dead or, or genetically engineering the virus so that it's weak, that usually takes a very long time. If we now have a mutation in, in the virus, because we have the code, it's, it's actually kind of like just copying and pasting. And, and now we just put in what, what the new version is. So to, it, to create a new vaccine that will be targeted to this particular strain, if there is like this super duper um, you know, strain that doesn't um, get affected by the vaccine, actually should not take as long to get to market. And that I think also is the feat of using the mRNA vaccines and also um, the, the Oxford, Oxford AstraZeneca platform is that they are amenable and adaptable if mutations do occur. Okay, excellent. Um, CMO, did you want to add? No, I think Dr. Walden has um, explained that perfectly well. Um, we, the data is still being developed. This is a new disease we must all remember. Uh, and so we're all learning more about this disease every day as we go along. Certainly, uh, it's been demonstrated that the um, Pfizer vaccine um, is, and the AstraZeneca vaccine are both protective from the UK strain and the South African strain. Uh, and the, the Brazilian strain, I think, is still in, in um, the studies are still ongoing, but um, I'll, be, I'll be very surprised if it doesn't cover it. Because the way these things are designed is, it's a 3D image. It's not just a 2D flat um, image uh, that you copy of this uh, uh, spike protein. And what you find in the variants is particular, uh, that there's a, a minor changes that affects in a tiny way, the way the uh, the um, the virus behaves, but the the um, vaccines are still able to record. It's a bit like um, a ball and socket. Uh, so if if you have a tiny lump, um, as long as it can still fit into that socket, it will still recognize it. It's only if it's maybe diff completely different shape <laughs> that it will not be able to fit into fit into that socket so that, that's that's a thing to remember 
the vaccines work for the strains that have been identified. And even if we've come to a situation where um, we find a, a strain that the vaccines are not effective against, as Dr. Weldon ex explained, it's a very, very simple process to change the vaccine and get something that works. Uh, we're all familiar with flu vaccination that we have to take a different one every year anyway. And the process of getting flu vaccines is actually several times harder than the new technology that's been, uh, uh, that, that we're not using now. So it, it makes a world of a difference. I, I would just add also, Adaranka, that um, you have to look at the timing of the rollout of the vaccine and the number of cases. So we're approaching 100 million cases that are documented and uh, we may have you know, 7 million doses of the Pfizer vaccine that's been administered thus far. Um, viruses typically will mutate and be selected based on pressures, natural selection pressures. So um, it, it would be premature, it would be too early in many ways for uh, this virus uh, to already not be amenable to the vaccine. Um, it is possible uh, in the future that uh, there will be a virus that's selected for that is, um, you know, penetrates through the protection of the vaccine. But right now, um, I, I would anticipate, uh, based on population dynamics, that uh, this would still be a very effective vaccine right now. All right. Um, I'm conscious of the time. I'm just going to ask you to bear with me just a little longer while I just take a few more questions uh, from uh, those who have posted on Facebook. And so I'll take this one. Um, if the vaccine is kept at such a low temperature and special refrigeration, how long can the doses be out of the freezer before spoiling? And is it a cold liquid that is being injected or room temperature? Who would like to take that? Uh, I, I can take that if, if, you, if you don't mind. Okay. Um, it's definitely not a cold liquid entering our bodies, it has to be thawed out. It's like getting some frozen chicken. You're not gonna eat that chicken frozen. You're gonna probably defrost it in the microwave or let it sit out overnight and then you're gonna cook it and then you're gonna ingest it into your body. So in a similar way, the vaccine, yes, for transport, after it's manufactured for distribution, transport and storage, yes, we're gonna keep it at the coldest temperatures so that we can keep the doses for as long as we need them. Once they come out of the freezer, they are then thawed out. And once they're thawed out, they can only be used within a five day period. Now, just to reiterate, when everyone goes and gets COVID tested, when you get the swab you know, down your nose, um, it then goes into a bag and that goes on ice for the same exact reason, because RNA is very fragile. It is not that strong and it will degrade and break up you know, on, on for different reasons and temperature or elevated temperature is one of them. And so that's why the temperature is kept low so that the mRNA doesn't just, you know, get broken down and, and there's no vaccine anymore. Um, once it is taken out, it's good for five days. And once it's um, been taken out to actually start to be administered, I believe um, CMO, you can, you can um, uh, confirm this, but I think there's maybe five or six doses you can get from one vial and that has to be given when, when that vial is now out giving doses within six hours. So it's a lot of logistics. And you know, the Ministry of Health, you know, has done a great job by making sure that there's no wastage. So there there are a lot of you know considerations, but for me to we're on top of it. If I can just add to that very briefly, it's uh, yeah, as Dr. Weldon said, um, what happens here is um, you take it out of the fridge, um, uh, out of the freezer into a fridge between two and six degrees. That's the temperature of um, the household fridge anyway. Um, you For six hours to allow it to thaw, and then you add the diluent into it. And once that is out of the deep freezer, you have 120 hours, five days to use that dose. So uh, the manufacturer talks of five doses in each vial. Occasionally, you might be able to squeeze out the sixth dose uh, from the same vial. And uh, we have um, a system in place that has people on standby yeah, <laughs> when we are fortunate to find that sixth vial, um, sixth dose, so that we make sure that not a drop of this precious commodity is wasted. Mm, excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
And um, I'm conscious of the time, 6.35. So I'll just take uh, one final question from Facebook. And when do you anticipate vaccinating the final everybody else uh, vaccine group? So this is a question of um, vaccine supply. Um, there, are, there are different um, considerations to, to uh, put into play in getting the vaccines on island and also uh, once the vaccines are on island, getting them into arms. Um, so there are quite a lot of moving parts to this and it's, it's difficult to give a prediction of the exact date when that is going to happen. But the expectation and the target of the ministry is that there will be everybody who is eligible for a vaccine and wants one will get one by the summer. Okay, excellent. Well, I'd like to thank each of you for participating today. Would you like to um, have some closing words as we end today's um, conversation? I can go for us. Always for each other to go. Um, yeah, I would say um, I'm I'm excited about this vaccine. Like I said, um, having heard about it from a research, you know, perspective for years, and being in the RNA field and kind of seeing those who were working on it and passionate about it, and seeing it now come to fruition, it's you can't you can't make this stuff up. This is this is awesome for you know it to be a pandemic stage is even even more mind blowing. But just to see this come come to pass and to be you know on, one of the first people in bringing it together, I think I was humbled as an RNA scientist. Um, for those who are considering to get vaccinated in Bermuda, um, obviously get the information that you need, uh, make the decision with full conviction, um, but it's, it's up to you, you know, don't feel pressured per se, but these types of conversations are good. They're healthy, ask the questions. Um, every week, the ministry, you know, will be having these, join the conversation talks, and it's, this is where you need to throw out the questions. Um, so as you're, scientist advisor for the country keep asking the questions and, and when you get satisfied then make the call or go online and, and book yourself in to get the vaccine okay excellent who likes to go next i don't mind okay are you to dr ashton I, I, i'm happy to follow no you. no no please please go ahead all right okay thank you uh, basically for me it's very it's a non-brainer i have a my parents are over 80. Um, my aunt and her husband, who I love very dearly, are over 80. I haven't seen them in over a year um, because they are all shielded. Um, I, I am extremely grateful for the hope that this vaccine offers and the, the hope that I can one day go and see them and actually hug them um, again. Uh, and that's something I'm looking forward to. So please don't take this for granted. This is years and years and years of hard work that has culminated in this point where we can have something that can give us some level of protection from this uh, pandemic. Uh, it is hard work that has gotten us so far. And this is um, something that we can all uh, do to be the one to break that chain and to give this, get this country back on its feet. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ayo. Dr. Ashton? Well, I must say what a journey it's been. Uh, and uh, I, I must say also that uh, I feel more optimistic than I have in months. Uh, here we have a tool uh, that we can use safely and effectively uh, to uh, get ourselves safe and open up the borders. Uh, and um, I just urge everyone to, to look at this. Obviously, this is not a replacement for a conversation with your healthcare provider who knows your particular health conditions uh, in detail. But um, the, the reality is that there's very few absolute contraindications for this vaccine. And I urge you to, to look seriously at, at, at that option. Well, thank you. Um, to each of you for participating today. I just want to remind everybody that we will be back next week, Saturday at 6 p.m. for 
vaccine awareness, join the conversation. We invite you to add your questions uh, if you're watching online and we'll have our panel of uh, vaccination experts answer the questions that you are asking. Thank you very much, Bermuda, and good night. Thank you. Bye.